Control and high resolution rotational spectroscopy of a similar molecular ion. Uh, uh, it's my great pleasure to be in this workshop and uh, talk about our uh, recent effort on the molecular ion project at NIST Boulder. Um, I realize I'm the first talk on molecular ion, so I can uh, put in a bit more introduction material. Um, because of the long trap lifetime, uh, molecular ions are uh, identified to be uh, good candidates for precision measurement and testing fundamental physics. And there have been various proposals on uh, testing time variation, the possible time variation of uh, uh, fundamental constants and, uh, for example, uh, proton to electron mass ratio using diatomic molecules. And uh, you could use uh, simple molecules, uh, simple molecular ions to uh, measure fundamental constants really precisely. And um, there's also, there's been a really uh, impressive result from uh, the, uh, Eric Cornell's group on uh, hafmium, hafmium fluoride ion measurement result. It's not quite at the ACME level yet, but uh, they are uh, quickly catching up uh, to constrain the magnitude of electron electro, uh, electric dipole moment. And uh, the reason why we uh, want to work with molecular ions uh, instead of going through the courageous endeavor uh, many of us have heard uh, yesterday uh, is because trapping charged particle is relatively straightforward. Uh, with a linear pole trap, that's what we use. We apply RF, uh, RF voltage on the uh, two rods that's diagonal and just ground the other two rods. And that oscillating uh, electric quadrupole potential confines the charged particle in the center of this uh, linear configuration. And then just by applying positive voltage on the, uh, we call N caps, N electrodes, we apply axial confinement. And that allows, it, allows us to uh, trap positively charged particles. <coughs> and to cool them, uh, since we have um, a, a toolbox that's developed in uh, laser cooling and trapping of, excuse me. <coughs> Uh, of uh, atomic ions, we can uh, exploit the coulomb interaction between uh, charged particles and put uh, molecular ions and atomic ions in the same trap and laser cool the atomic ions and through this, what we call sympathetic cooling, the translational motion of the molecular ions are also cooled. Okay. So uh, trapping and cooling, um, it's, it's really challenging for neutral molecules, and for us, we, we are kind of cheating. We are using charged uh, molecules, and that's really easy. So uh, identifying that uh, at our group, we want to develop a general protocol for the spectroscopy of molecular ions. Um, in particular, we have been enjoying uh, really high precision in terms of measurement precision and uh, quantum state control for atomic ions, uh, we would like to extend that to many species of molecular ions. The molecular ion we start with is just a simple hydride, a calcium hydride. Uh, the reason we work with that is because um, we have lasers for calcium atomic ion. And uh, to get hydrides, relatively straightforward. You just trap two calcium ions and we leak in hydrogen, yeah. Leaking hydrogen into our ultra-high vacuum apparatus. Uh, 
And uh, after some time, uh, one of the calcium will react with hydrogen and get calcium hydride, and then we just close the valve to stop the reaction process. Um, with the toolbox provided by atomic ion quantum control, we are able to uh, cool the uh, shared harmonic motion between the ions in the same trap to the uh, quantum mechanical ground state, and the motion of the ions needs to be treated as quantized harmonic oscillator, and we can get to the ground state, and we can also coherently drive to the uh, first excited state, and the atomic ion allows us do that, to do that and efficiently detect the motionless state. Um, for this crowd, I don't need to say what this is, but uh, you just need to know and the room temperature apparatus, our calcium hydride ion is in the electronic ground state, and vibrationally it's not also not excited, it's also in the uh, ground state. The rotational constant for calcium hydride is about 140 gigahertz. Uh, so at room temperature, it's actually in thermal equilibrium with uh, the black body radiation. It's a polar molecule. And the um, uh, nuclear spin of the proton uh, increase the number of states we need to worry about. So uh, at room temperature, only like 1% of population can be found in each of these sublevels. And that's the uh, problem we are facing in terms of doing quantum state control of this uh, of molecules, actually. Um, in the following, I'm going to use this uh, J equal 1, rotational quantum, quantum number J equal 1 manifold as an example to tell you how we uh, tackle this problem. Uh, the, the levels are actually described by a uh, simple Hamiltonian, and uh, it has uh, exact solution. It's uh, by uh, Brad Robbie formula. At finite uh, magnetic field, uh, we apply about uh, 3.6 Gauss of magnetic field. The levels are in this kind of uh, arrangement. And in each rotational manifold, we identify a transition that, uh, in this case, J equal 1, we have around 10 kilohertz transition frequency. That's unique in this uh, atomic ion, molecular ion combination. And for a J equal 2, we have uh, similar uh, situation. This transition is around 13 kilohertz. So with this, if we try to address a 13 kilohertz transition, we know only this transition is being addressed. That's how we can say um, we are only dealing with two-level system uh, in this case. Uh, the way we do uh, state preparation is actually a projective, projective state preparation. Uh, we first prepare the motional state shared by the atomic ion, molecular ion, in the motional ground state. And then we address this transition that has unique frequency, but not directly on the transition, but the sideband, emotional sideband of the transition. So if the uh, molecule is start starts in this state, now the emotional uh, sideband would move the population over. And as I mentioned, uh, our uh, atomic ion provides a really versatile tool set. And we can make a projective measurement on the emotional state. And although it's, uh, the probability is small, but we do see that uh, with high confidence, if this emotional state was changed from the ground state to the first excited state. And then with that positive measurement, we know that the molecule is definitely in the final state of this driven transition. And since we are only driving this transition uh, due to the signature transition frequency, we know the molecule is in this state. And uh, borrowing from uh, the original quantum logic spectroscopy uh, proposal, we are able to uh, devise optical pumping to concentrate a population of the molecule to further increase the signal to noise ratio because uh, we are still facing this 1% population that's like 1% in the signal. So what we do is we 
<laughs> we drive a sideband, but that, that moves the population and the shelves the population over. But instead of doing a projective measurement, we cool the motion. That introduces uh, that introduces a dissipation that render this coherent uh, sideband operation uh, irreversible. So that's that's the dis dissipation we are adding into the system. So it's pretty difficult to do, or it's not common. You can just apply uh, introduce dissipation without worry about the population being lost. But for us, this uh, population operation is done coherently, and the dissipation is done through atomic ion. Okay, And we can just keep doing this kind of uh, operation and move population around and concentrate uh, population of the molecule to a target state we like. The way we uh, drive the molecular transition is through a stimulated Raman transition. We, uh, for population operation within a rotational manifold, we use um, a pair of Raman beams derived from 1051 nanometer fiber laser. And um, to drive a uh, sideband transition, we just use a pi polarized and sig uh, one sigma polarized uh, Raman beam and tune the laser frequency so they just uh, res resonantly drive a sideband transition. As I mentioned, this is a coherent process. So we don't excite the excited state of the molecule. So we don't lose um, the population of the molecule to um, other unwanted states. And since we only need this laser to be of resonant to uh, molecular transitions, uh, this laser can be applicable to many molecular ion species. And uh, this protocol could be applicable to many molecular ion species. And uh, I have some animation to g further give you some idea of how we do this state preparation. We st the system start with the atomic ion, molecular ion, and uh, harmonic motion. And then the molecule, we just don't know which rotational state it is in. We start the protocol by doing sideband cooling uh, on the atomic ion, and the translational motion is in the motional ground state. And uh, we just don't know which rotational state the molecule is in. And uh, we can do optical pumping to try to kind of align the uh, molecular, molecular rotation. But at this point, we still don't know which speed it's uh, rotating. And then we start our projection attempts. We would try to address those sidebands of the uh, transitions with signature transition frequencies. We'll try one frequency and see if we succeeded in driving the sideband. And the state detection on the atomic ion would say, no, you, you didn't hit the right frequency. Okay, so we will try another frequency. Did we hit it yet? No. No, we keep trying until we hit a frequency that excites the sideband. And then the state detection on the uh, atomic ion will say, hey, you succeeded. And um, now that we, we would know which state the molecule is in, then that finishes our state preparation uh, step. It's ready for further manipulation or um, a spectroscopy experiment. <coughs> And if, we, if all the effort failed, then we wait for um, background ra black body radiation to thermalize the population of the uh, molecular ion and start over. And with the um, prepared pure state, we can do um, coherent spectroscopy. And this is just our uh, first uh, stage of effort we were able to, to get really narrow transition uh, spectroscopy. And for the, uh, th these are the uh, transitions with the uh, signature frequencies. And you might notice that the contrast isn't that great. And this is not um, acceptable, acceptable in, in our group, I would say. Uh, 
Yeah, because they were uh, they were looking at like three nights, four nights of um, uh, fidelity. So peop the first question is, what's limiting it? And w we we know that there's some heating that we need to address, and we were able to increase the uh, sideband contrast quite, quite significantly. It's still not three nights, but um, uh, this is really good enough, and was able to proceed with this high. Uh, sideband contrast, and oh, we can also coherently flop between two levels with high contrast, so that's uh, really a building block for our protocol. We have uh, pure state preparation, we have kind of high fidelity operation, uh, coherent operation. But uh, you might notice that uh, up to now I have only talked about operation within a rotational manifold, and those are 10 kilohertz, 20 kilohertz transition. And we are still at the mercy of black body radiation in terms of getting the molecule in the state we want. So um, Didi, among others, has a um, nice proposal that uh, suggests using a frequency cone to drive many different rotational transitions and all at once, just with one frequency cone directly. And um, the idea is pretty simple. Um, in frequency domain, the frequency cone can be considered as a mini narrow line with lasers uh, equally spaced by the repetition rate of the pulse. And if we can tune the um, uh, spacing of these cones properly, we can get one cone pair, uh, cone teeth pair, to satisfy this um, resonance condition that, uh, for the transition we want to drive. And since these lasers are equally spaced in frequency, uh, the other pairs would also be resonant. So uh, then the whole uh, spectrum can be used to drive a Raman transition. And this has been demonstrated uh, in uh, uh, Ytterbium uh, ion hyperfine transition that's 12 gigahertz in frequency and uh, also to extend it to terahertz transition it has been demonstrated in calcium ion uh, fine structure uh, transition. And in the lab, uh, what we use is a phenosecond sapphire laser frequency comb and we split it into two and shift the frequency with two AOMs and uh, we have a delay line to make sure the pulses would arrive at the ions at the same time. And the, way w the reason why we do this instead of tweaking the uh, repetition rate is because um, for a Raman transition frequency that we want to address, we can decompose it into an uh, integer multiple of uh, repetition rate. And then the remainder whatever the repetition rate cannot cover, we can cover it with the AOM frequency. So you can see that by changing the AOM frequency within microsecond, we can change the Raman frequency we address. And again, the, um, all the cone T's would contribute to driving that transition. And um, of course, we use that comb to do spectroscopy. And we first prepare the uh, molecular state, as I mentioned, previous part of the talk. And then we're sending a cone pulse that drives a Raman transition and change the population. And then we try to detect the uh, population in the initial state. And we can also detect the population in the final state. And the spectra is, uh, as expected, we, if we prepare in JGRU2 and uh, for this Raman transition in um, linear molecule, the the rotational quantum number needs to change by two. Uh, so we see that we remove population from J group two and it shows up in J group four. And we uh, reversely, we can prepare in J group four and we see that the, trans the population shows up in J group two. And since we can uh, prepare the state and we can detect the final state, that uh, facilitates our assignment of this uh, observed line to a specific transition. And we, we did these 
uh, kind of uh, rotational spectroscopy on many transitions. And uh, we were able to get like sub 100 hertz statistical uncertainty. And with these uh, many transition frequencies, we can try to derive the rotational constants to sub kilohertz and centrifugal correction, and second centrifugal correction. And you can imagine we can get many, many uh, terms in terms of uh, this molecular constants. But there is a bit uh, complication in here. And you, you can see uh, everything seems to work pretty nicely. But just recently, we realized uh, the systematic shift needs to be really well taken care of. What we have observed is uh, there is some problem with in our uh, setup in that uh, when, we are, when we are doing this uh, spectroscopy of this transition, uh, we prepare the stay here, uh, try to drive that transition. This is now like below 10 kilohertz. And we try to detect whether we made that transition by looking at the population here. And what we have seen was we saw two dips. That means there are two transitions. But um, the selection rule for this pi polarized light, sigma minus polarized light, um, actually only allows uh, one transition around this, um, this region, this frequency domain. So we were scratching our head, what's going on? Uh, and then. Eventually, when we try to change micromotion, that's the electric field uh, of the trap RF that's providing the confinement, that's also uh, driving a small motion of the ion. And when we change that, we saw that the splitting reduced. And that's, uh, that propon uh, prompt us to uh, develop a model. And I don't know if this is correct, but this is the current working theory that we are looking at a Raman type of coupling from the trap RF electric field. That's basically zero Raman frequency. That's why we don't see that when we do uh, spectroscopy on these transitions, because they are not degenerate. But these levels, they are near degenerate. And we are basically dressing the states that's near degenerate. And then uh, this splitting is basically the uh, Rabi ray of this dressing. And since the uh, trap RF electric field might have other polarization, we have uh, dressing for other states. And with the comb uh, pulse, we can also do coherent manipulation between rotational levels. And we can see that. We have a uh, nice Robbie flop between different rotational levels. And uh, we have also started uh, exploring the uh, quantum information type of operation on molecules, on molecular ions. Uh, in particular, we have uh, studied entanglement between uh, calcium hydride ion and uh, atomic ion. Wh what we did was uh, using two levels in calcium ion uh, once one in S manifold, the other is in D manifold. And for the molecular ion, we can choose two levels in the same rotational manifold to start with. And we, we initialize the uh, molecule atom motion each in a pure state. And then what we did was uh, pi over two molecule motion sideband, uh, just moving half way of the uh, population half of the population away from the uh, initial state. And then uh, we get the equal superposition of uh, either the molecule is spin up or spin down, and the motion is in the ground state or first excited state. So this is actually an entangled state of the molecule and the motion. And then we just map the uh, state of the motion onto the atomic ion with a pi pulse. So for us, it's. Um, it's, it's been done for a long time. So at the end, we have uh, spin up and S state plus spin down D state uh, equals position. And that's a, a quantum entangled state. 
And to verify the entanglement, we did uh, measure the population of the state and also uh, a parity flop. The fidelity is derived from this uh, fringe contrast to be around 87% fidelity. It's still uh, not nice, but uh, I mean, not above 90% or too nice, but it's still a good starting point. And uh, with the molecule, uh, the reason why we want to do this is uh, the two level system in the molecule could be in different rotational state. So they could be, uh, the spin, uh, spin down, spin up state could be separated by 855 gigahertz. And uh, we are able to create an entangled state with a somewhat lower fidelity. But this is um, uh, proof that a uh, molecule could be uh, subjected to quantum information type of uh, operation. And it, uh, the molecules could provide a broad selection of uh, transition frequencies that if we want to talk to other platform with, say, uh, uh, optical qubit or st uh, superconducting qubit, uh, the molecule could provide a selection of transition frequencies. Okay, um, to summarize, uh, we have demonstrated pro probabilistic projective molecular state preparation with Raman beams, and we, we are able to coherently manipulate molecular state with either CW or post Raman beams, and uh, ro terahertz rotational transitions were measured precisely, and you can infer molecular constants. And we are using far detuned Raman beams to uh, coherently manipulate molecular state. So this, is, we think, is applicable to other molecular species. And we have demonstrated atom-molecule entanglement. And here's an experimental setup we, um, compared to what I heard before, uh, in this meeting. I think it's relatively simple. Uh, we have uh, ion trap and uh, Raman beams coming in, these two ports, and uh, laser light going into the, uh, for addressing atomic ions. Yeah. Here's the group. Uh, Didi and I started the uh, experiment, and, and Dave Librand uh, also provided uh, uh, significant support. And many other uh, postdocs and uh, Ehan especially uh, contributed to the entanglement experiment. OK, thank you for your attention. Can you, can you say a little more about this uh, RF trap or online thing? Yeah. Is it a Yeah, so... Which is how far away? No, no. So, you see, this is electric field oscillating at the trap RF frequency. And you could have pi polarized electric field. Yeah. No, I guess, but the, the J plus 2 space is like really far away. Yes. It's like... It's so it's so like No, it's not. Because yeah. uh, we we have axial uh, RF field that's not zero, and uh, we estimate it to be like a kilohertz. Uh, in in this case, it's uh, no uh, kilo volt per meter. Yeah. yeah, but you see over here it's like a couple hundred hertz. Yeah, but. Uh, we haven't get we haven't got a quantitative agreement yet, but I think we will need to uh, not treat we would need to treat this uh, coupling as one term in the Hamiltonian, not as a perturbation. So we haven't done that yet. Uh, I. Did not mention that, but I think uh, that's next. So, well, this is Rabi oscillation, but uh, this kind of Rabi oscillation gives us like good contrast until like five milliseconds. 
Well, it's not saying a T2 is 5 millisecond, but it's a right ballpark. Okay, so first, uh, what, what's limiting the coherence time? It's because we didn't go all the way to uh, stabilize with uh, optical reference, because we want to tell people this is not that difficult. So what we did was just referencing the repetition rate to uh, uh, RF synthesizer. So it's the limit, it's the line width of the, or coherence of the synthesizer. And we do have plan to just use one of our many clock lasers to just <laughs> stabilize the hell out of it. And the other is uh, the other question is how long does it take? Um, so you see, uh, right now our state preparation is still probabilistic. So we are actually doing like many of these spectrum in one uh, experiment uh, run. So within an hour, we can get four or six of the spectrum because we don't get to choose where the molecule is, but we do know when the molecule visits the state. So we get six spectrum in, say, an hour. Yeah. I'm just curious. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning of your talk that the techniques you develop is good for any other. Not any other, science. but yeah. So, but I, from my, my experience, I understand that hydrogen ion is very special. It is? Oh, yes, okay. they have very nice rotational structures uh -huh, uh -huh. when it's not true for more heavy ions. Okay. Would it be okay? Would you do yeah, you see, the heavier ion would have lower uh, rotational constants. Yeah. Uh, um, but our state preparation <coughs> did not rely on the rotational constant. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, what we rely on is um, some transition with uh, unique transition frequencies. So I think for, say, so for molecules, I think the rotational transitions would be unique in frequency because they are not equally spaced. So that's one, one thought that uh, if we can't identify this kind of uh, hyperfine transition with unique frequencies, we could use the comb to drive sideband of the rotational transition. Uh, but there are other tricks we can play. It's uh, up to 10 seconds, I think. Yeah, but the lifetime in let, and say the ground <coughs> rotational level is like six seconds at room temperature. Yeah. All right. Any more questions at this point? If not, then uh, thank you for your guest. Oh, yeah. Sure. Let me make sure it's on. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate the chance to be here. I don't know that we need a new path to quantum logic after that talk. I think it's all sorted out. But uh, I'll give you a couple other alternatives, I hope. Um, an outline for what I want to talk about is here. Um, I want to first ask the question of do we actually need molecular quantum logic? You're an open minded crowd. This is a safe space. Everybody's going to say yes, but I think the answer is a little more nuanced, especially if you hang around with like real ion trappers, and unfortunately I've been doing that a little bit. 
Uh, and so I've had to sharpen my argument a bit, and I'll share that with you. Uh, then, then I'll tell you what uh, one idea for uh, quantum logic that I've been working on with Wes Campbell. After that, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about our work taming molecules, molecular ions, uh, and then I'll, I'll switch over to two, I hope, forward-looking things. One of them is that spam is hard. Now, James knows what spam is, but the rest of you may not. Spam is state preparation and measurement in the ion trapping lingo. Uh, and this is what James just showed us how to do. It's hard for us. We, the way we do it right now is destructive. We'd like it to not be. And so there's a couple ideas for how to get around that. And then at the end, I'm going to briefly talk about something I'm getting really excited about, and that is a new type of quantum logic that we're calling dipole phonon quantum logic. And I've been working on this with Wes Campbell and Dave Patterson. So, all right, bear with me on this. Uh, this is a, was a lot of words, but I'm going somewhere with it. So the dipole-dipole interaction provides a strong, long-range tunable anisotropic interaction between molecules. It leads to many novel and exciting phenomena, quantum computing, quantum simulation, as said by literally everyone in this room at some point. All right. Well, let's ask the question, is this actually important, right? Because if you, if you hang around with ion trappers, what you'll find out is, look, these guys for some time have had plenty of, you know, lattice spin models, right? The monopole interaction in an ion trap is much longer range than a dipole-dipole interaction, right? When you add phonons, it's now anisotropic. In principle, you can pick every one of these J's so you can make any model, right? I mean, at least that maps onto like an Ising spin like this. And they're doing it, right? So, so is there anything left for us? And also for quantum computation, I mean, they already have quantum computers, right? This is something very recent uh, done on one of the INQ machines where they're calcul or estimating the ground state of the water molecule using some of these variational algorithms that were developed uh, in the Harvard Chemistry Department. So, you know, what's left for us? Well, I think there's, there's two or three things that are, that are important. One is, you obviously want a diversity of these models. You can't do everything with trapped ions. That's an easy one, right? But one I think that's more subtle, and it's debatable, but I think it's important, is that this equal sign is really an approximate sign, right? And so if we want to get to the point where we show real quantum advantage for a simulation, right? So you're going to be in a place where you can't simulate it classically. You know, all these sampling methods to sort of validate it are hard. Like, Who's to say that the phase transition you're seeing is not because you left out some counter-rotating term, right? And that's sort of what's driving everything. And that sounds kind of dumb and small, but the whole point of quantum simulation is to get to that regime. So I actually think like in five or 10 years, that's gonna be really important. And so as you'll see with molecules, they sort of give you these Hamiltonians uh, with a smaller approximate sign there. And the things that you're approximating are different. So it's a nice way of validating quantum simulation. And for me, after hanging around these ion trappers, I feel like quantum simulation is the thing that I'm going to get to see over my lifetime do something cool. So I'm kind of excited about this. For, the, for, the, for quantum computation, the sort of dirty truth of this is, they, is that this is done with like six qubits, right? So these things are, like, have super high fidelities. All the gates are worked out. We know we need thousands of qubits to run the surface code. So why do they have six qubits, right? The answer is that the monopoles and phonons, which are the things that you use to build a quantum computer, are a complicated marriage, right? The phonons make the whole thing work, but they also kind of get in the way. Uh, and they get in the way in two ways. One is if you want to build one of these registers and say, you know, here's like, I think this is, we were trapping I don't know, eight qubits. The normal mode spectrum that you're using for the simulation of the or the computation starts to get more and more crowded, right? There are n normal modes along the axis for n ions. So you keep growing the qubit number, it just becomes a harder control problem. That's sort of generic to a lot of qubits, so maybe you just have to learn to deal with it. But you may want to say, well, let me just forget about that. I'm going to take my ions, put them on a chip, shuttle them around and do sort of, you know, pairwise entangling interactions. 
so that I don't have to deal with mode crowding. Well, when you do that, there's this unexpected problem uh, called anomalous heating in the field, where the ions near a surface heat up faster than they should. They actually heat up faster than black body says they should, which is a pretty profound statement when you think about it. Uh, and although a lot of progress has been made on it, it's, it's certainly not a solved problem at this point. And so I'm sure James and I will be at NACTI, which is the, this North American ion trapping conference in a few weeks. I don't know if any of you will be there. If you're there, you won't hear me say this, uh, but I'll say it here because this is a safe space, is that these phonon modes are sort of the weak part of trapped ion quantum computing. It's the Achilles heel. So it would be really great if we didn't have to depend on phonons to do things. We're simple people, so why don't we just try to replace monopoles with dipoles? All right. And so here's a picture from uh, our lab of, I think this is five barium ions. And here are two barium chloride molecules. And the hope is to now use dipole-dipole interactions somehow to, to do quantum logic. Well, you know about all the different uh, dipolar quantum logic schemes. The, the problem is that in the ion trap, they don't just you know, natively port over. If you think about the, the scheme that Dave, who's setting up there, proposed almost 20 years ago now. What's that? Oh, sorry. Uh, almost 20 years ago now. The, uh, because the ion traps trap ions at the electric field equals zero point, they actually don't have a dipole moment, right? So this dipole-dipole interaction uh, doesn't work that way. If you want to do some sort of, you know, Lucan type experiment or blockade type of entangling gates, these things are a little too far apart. I mean, the closest you can get them is about a micron if you work really hard. Uh, and maybe that's okay, but you'd really like to be in the five or 10 micron range. Okay? And so working with Wes Campbell, who I think a lot of you know, we uh, tackled this problem and I think have a nice solution to it. Around the same time, uh, Conquin, Till Rosenbaum, and David Grimes uh, proposed something really similar uh, it's like the same thing, really, for neutral molecules. Um, all right. So how does it work? There's a lot of different ways to see it. I, I like this one the best. Um, so imagine you have two molecules sitting next to each other. They're in an ion trap. They're in, say, the j equals zero state. All right. So here's the wave function of j equals zero. I'm going to assume the blue atom is super heavy and the red atom is light. And this is just the distribution of the red atom around the blue atom. All right. So j equals zero looks like this. I come in with a pi over two pulse, and I make a superposition of say j equals zero and j equals one, right? But that superposition is not an eigenstate, so it's gonna evolve. And what I get is that the dipoles are just flop flopping back and forth, right, at the rotational splitting. But they're flopping back and forth in phase, so they rectify the dipole-dipole interaction, even though they're in, they're in zero field. And so that means when your next pi over two pulse comes in, what you get out depends on the delay time right, of your, your Ramsey sequence. You accumulate some extra phase because of this interaction, and it's really easy to just prepare a Bell state like this. Okay. Now, what's exciting about this from our point of view as ion trappers is that this Hamiltonian, which you can write, is just a simple spin exchange Hamiltonian. Here, these, these poly operators are just on the, the sort of the SU2 of the two molecule state. Um, to first order, it doesn't depend on the phonon number at all. Uh, you have to go to the second order to see that. And so it means it's really insensitive to temperature. In fact, uh, this is a simulation we did for, I think it was a CO plus molecule. If you just look at the red curve, it's just for when the microwaves are along the, the trap axis. The, this entangling gate fidelity, even at a Kelvin, is several nines. Maybe even, you know, it's not, certainly not four nines, but, but it's at least three nines. Even at two Kelvin, it's not so bad. Right, so to contrast that, you know, ground state cooling is like, you know, way over here, right, at, at equals zero. So this makes things so much easier that you could imagine going back to this chip trapping idea where you have molecular ions, you shuttle them around, you bring them together to do gates, and then you have different, you know, zones for readout. What's um, sort of, I think, exciting about it is if you pick the right molecule, you wouldn't even need any lasers as long as you can do the readout without lasers, you can just do this whole thing at dilution refrigeration temperatures, which would be a pretty big simplification. Okay, so, so that was, that's sort of the why we need quantum logic with molecules and one way of doing it. Let me tell you a little bit about what we've been doing in the lab, and that is trying to get a hold 
uh, of molecules. So we want to work move from atomic ions, which are kind of these little spheres, to you know molecular ions. You guys all know these things can vibrate, they can rotate, and so they're just sort of a harder cat to tame, if you will. Uh, they're sort of <laughs> petsladies.com. Uh, <laughs> um, there's sort of four things you have to do, right? You have to get the motion, the vibration, the rotation. But these molecules, and especially in our system, we have to worry about them reacting. So we also have to be able to control the chemistry. Um, I'm not really going to talk about the first three. Um, well, actually, let me first introduce the system. All right, so how do we do this? Um, so we do something that we call the motion trap. We take a magneto-optical trap and an ion trap. We stick it together. It spells motion. Uh, and the idea is that you know, you just use sympathetic cooling, just like ice in a drink, to cool down our molecular ions, right? Pretty general as long as things, you know, don't misbehave. What it looks like with a little more detail is here, there's a linear Paul trap. When you zoom in, when it's on, we use a calcium magneto-optical trap as our ultra-cold atoms. We trap different ions uh, inside of this, and here's a picture with some barium ions that are laser-cooled into a Coulomb crystal. Now, when we're loading in molecular ions, if you can see this, we are left with the following problem. So I think these are some euterbium ions, and here's a couple molecular ions. You can't see them, right, because they're not interacting with the laser, so how do you know uh, what they are? Likewise, we actually deal with a lot of chemistry uh, in our group as well, and so we often are faced with the problem of we have some trapped ion cloud, and then we have a reaction where you see one of them Atom, one of the ions became a molecule that we can no longer see. So how do we identify these things? We need to do it in a way that's very general because you never know what you're going to get when you're doing chemistry. So uh, Stephen Showalter, uh, who was an undergrad with John Doyle, I think, and Christian Schneider, who came from uh, Max Planck, these guys did a sort of wonderful job integrating a mass spectrometer into an ion trap. And so what we can do now is at a push of a button, see every ion uh, in the trap, you know, at better than isotopic resolution. So this has been a really big uh, tool for us. And we've actually built, I think, 10 of these things now for other groups. They're uh, pretty useful. Okay, so, uh, so with that system, we've been working on sort of taming this cat. And to date, we've sort of got control of the center of mass motion and the internal states. Um, the internal states cooling came first. A few years later, it was... Uh, Svetlana and Thierry Stokeland did some really brutal calculations uh, to, to explain it all and to show that it's actually a very general effect that you're going to get really good internal state cooling with ultra-cold atoms and molecule, molecular ions. The emotional cooling uh, was actually in some ways a lot harder, even though it seems simple. You know, if you think, I mean, put one ion inside of a buffer gas, what temperature does it go to? Turns out it doesn't go to the buffer gas temperature because this is an ion trap and everything's harder. Um, if you put two ions, it goes to a different temperature. If you put three, it turns out that there's two answers. It depends on the initial conditions. And so these were some open problems that went back to Damel, actually. But uh, over time, we were able to solve them, and we could sort of, I mean, this is, we don't need to go in detail here, but you could see that the blue points, this is ion number, are if you prepare things cold, the red points are if you prepare them hot. Uh, and in this instance, you see this sort of bifurcation that happens, and then these things close. But all that's sort of worked out now. Uh, and so what we've been doing over the last uh, year or so is getting control of the last thing, and that is the chemistry. Um, the, the system we mostly have been working with is a barium chloride molecular ions and our calcium mod. The reason we chose this is because all the products of any of these reactions are at least 7,000 Kelvin higher than energy than the ground state. So, you know, by design, we've precluded these ground state reactions. But, you know, if you're astute, you say, wait a minute, I can see this calcium mod, right? We have lasers on. And so that means that there's some calcium P state around. It turns out we really want to leave these lasers on because of these heating effects I, I mentioned earlier, you want to have some continuous cooling. So, you know, there's really just no way to, to make these excited state channels be closed. They're always going to be open for any combination I know about. Um, so, <clears throat> that's a little scary. 
And what's even scarier is this excited state has a quadrupole moment, right? A p-state can support a quadrupole moment. And I think most people know about Langevin capture theory, like ion-induced dipole, C4 over R to the 4. You get a rate constant that's just flat in, in temperature. It turns out for ion quadrupole, it's even worse. It just screams up as you go to low temperature. And so this could be really bad for us. The colder we go, the faster our ions go away. Um, and so we worked on this problem. Pratik and Mike are two excellent grad students. Sadly, Pratik is defending on Friday. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, it's too soon, too soon. Uh, and Robin Cote, I think many of you know. You guys, some of you may know Arthur Suits. He's an amazing uh, physical chemist. So we went uh, to measure this, but we, we wanted to do a really good job of this. We wanted to be able to really uh, see these features. And if you've done any sort of chemical reaction measurements before, you know that you, know, you always have some velocity distribution, right? You have some temperature, and you have to average over it. And it really just dulls any features that you're looking for. So we spent some time developing uh, a technique that we called ion shuttling. So we could look at collisions as a function of energy and not temperature. And the way that works is, as James mentioned, you have these end caps, and you can just you know, put DC voltages on it. And when you do, you can just move the ion back and forth. So if you do that with a MOT in the middle, and you construct a waveform so that the ion goes through the MOT at a single velocity, you can look at reactions as a function of energy, not temperature. Now, this. Sounds easy, but James can tell you it's a giant pain in the ass to do this with ions because you start shaking ions and they heat up. And so we spent a long time uh, designing waveforms to do this. We wrote the most boring paper I've ever written in my life uh, here. But it, if you need to do this, it's in there, uh, not how to do it. It's, only, it's boring because there's so many technical details. Uh, but you can do it, and the results are actually pretty cool. So here's a picture of us shuttling one ion back and forth through the MOT. You only see it at the endpoints because it spends most of its time there. Um, you can do this with a chain. And in fact, we can even implant a molecular ion in the middle and hold it there and shuttle it through so we can look at molecular ion uh, chemistry sort of one by one. And you can even do it with more complicated geometries. So when you do this, here's what you see. There are two P states <coughs> in calcium that you have to think about when you're running a calcium MOT. One is this long-lived uh, triplet states. What we see there as a function of energy is that the reaction rate, in fact, just screams up like you would expect. The theory is sort of a band because there's some uncertainties in the quadrupole moment. And so this is a little scary. But we can actually repump out this state so we don't worry about it too much. Um, the state we really worry about is the singlet P1. And interestingly, that guy departs from uh, this ion dipole capture, and goes to zero as you go to low temperature. So why is that? Well, uh, because we've developed this apparatus, when you're looking at a chemical reaction, you know, one of the first things we often do is look at the products to try to figure out what's going on. So we could dump this into the mass spec, look at the products. We can see the calcium chloride, the barium products, and we can measure the branching ratios of this. And those are shown in blue for the, the three different molecular ion products. What's shown in red is what's called phase-based theory. So phase-based theory is basically just state counting for the number of product states, right? So you're assuming uh, all the product states are equally like, likely. With the subject of angular momentum has to be conserved, right? So you count all the states you can access by energy, but make sure that you, know, you, you can reach them uh, given your, you know, incoming angular momentum. And so you do that, and you see actually really good agreement with the data. And so what that suggests to you, these branching ratios are statistical, means you have a really long-lived collision complex. Right? And then you start thinking about how long is that, right? So it lives for a long time, so like these, you know, these three atoms come together and rattle around, rattle around, uh, and sort of just equally find, you know, all possible outcomes. So how long? Well, you could calculate it from sort of chemists would use sort of, you know, maybe like RRKM theory to calculate sort of the complex lifetime. But it turns out that that's actually a big underestimate because of something we know about in this field. And that is that uh, if you think back, uh, if you think of just a, an atom colliding with an ion, 
There's a large dark shift when the ion gets close to the atom. That's another way of saying there's a C4 over R4 interaction. And they're very different for these two states. So you can only excite this with your lasers at really long range. In our case, it's 1,000 Bohr radii, which is like you know, miles away. And because you're going so close or so slow, before you get to the uh, short range, these things just spontaneously emit. And so then all of your collisions actually happen on the ground state. And so you're sort of naturally protected from these reactions. So we can include that. <clears throat> and when we do, we see sort of qualitative, if not quantitative, agreement. Um, but we wanted to be sure about this because this is pretty important for us. So we did this in yet another system. So we replaced the molecular ion with atomic ions. They're a little bit easier for us to control because we can laser cool them directly. Uh, and you can see here the agreement between theory and experiment is quite good. Uh, the theory without the suppression effect is here, and with the suppression effect uh, is here. And we said, well, if this is really what's going on, we should be able to turn this off. We should be able to apply a, we call it the catalyst laser, to dress uh, the ground state, and they, to dress the atom so that there's an avoiding crossing between the ground state and the excited state near a crossing with the exit channel. So that we're sort of preferentially exciting to this upper potential right in the sort of chemistry zone. And when we do that, um, we see that as a function of this intensity, the, the rate constant increases. It's reproduced by a simple landau zeter model and sort of agrees better with some coupled channels calculations. As a function of frequency, we see similar agreement as well. And so this was all done. Uh, these the coupled channels calculation was done by Svetlana. Uh, and her postdoc mean. And I think the paper will come out in a week or two probably. All right, so what does this all mean? Well, it means chemistry isn't inevitable. That, you know, these excited state reactions are naturally suppressed. Now, if you've been in AMO for a while, you sort of know this isn't the first time this has happened. Paul Julian saw, predicted something like this, and, or, or treated with uh, me, Frederick Meese, you know, talked about this in 89, Dave Pritchard, Alan Gallagher, among others, saw these sorts of effects, but in neutral atom collisions. But what's interesting here is, you know, first of all, not everybody believed it would happen for atoms and ions because the potentials are very different. We certainly believed it or we wouldn't have done <laughs> this for the beginning. But what I find sort of striking about it is this is actually mattering in sort of the 5 to 10 Kelvin temperature range, right? That's pretty hot. So that means sort of regular chemists have to worry about this effect. And, and at the moment, they, they typically don't. All right, so what does it mean? It means this is going to work. We've tamed all four things that we have to tame for our cat, right? But we still have this problem of spam. So I'm not talking about it here, but right now, we do it with uh, resonantly enhanced multiphoton dissociation. It's a pain in the butt because you have to start over every time you detect, right? And so we. So what we're working on now in this experiment is entangling these molecules with this uh, scheme I mentioned earlier. But we'd really like to be able to do the state preparation and measurement more quickly and, you know, without destruction. Um, and so I'm involved in another project with Wes Campbell. Um, we had a great postdoc, Dave Huckle, who's now at Air Force, and, and a grad student, Justin Christensen, developing a, a trapped ion qubit that had never been used before. And this experience sort of taught me the importance of, of being able to do spam uh, well and quickly. So barium-133 is sometimes called the Goldilocks qubit for trapped ions. You may say, then why doesn't everybody use it? The, the point is that everything's just right about it, like, you know, like baby bear soup. Um, as Dave Huckle would say, there's only one problem with it. There isn't any. And that's because it's radioactive. It has a 10-year half-life, and it, it's all gone. Uh, but you can make it. And if you're careful, you can figure out how to laser cool it and trap it. So we measured all the laser frequencies that you needed and all the hyperfine splittings uh, and now have this qubit going. And the way we do state preparation and measurement here is with electron shelving. You can you know, hide the population in some metastable state and then you know, look for fluorescence in some manifold. And so you have a bright state and a dark state, which we call 0 and 1, the bright state you see, the dark state you don't, right? just like what James showed earlier. Uh, in barium-133, what you do, well, in, in all electron shelving, what you do is you apply your laser, and you get two histograms, right? So if you get, say, anywhere above 10 counts, 
you determine you were in the zero state, and less than that, you determine you're in the one state. Uh, these histograms are actually really good by trapped ion standards. Our spam fidelity is approaching four nines. It's actually the world record by a factor of two, I think, over uh, what Dave Lucas did for a single qubit. So here the Robbie oscillations basically almost go to one, right? So that's pretty fun. And so how, would, how do we get this in the, in the molecule world? Well, we had a sort of, with this same uh, gang, we, ha we had sort of a, a little mystery that popped up that we explored that may have presented the answer for us. So we were trapping uh, barium ions, and after like 10 minutes, we noticed they start to go away. And so we have this mass spec, we could hit a button, and we could see that, you know, here's the barium, out here is what this heavy stuff, or this dark stuff is, and it's barium methoxide, BaOCH3. Turns out that this is a reaction product of barium with methanol, so I guess we had a small virtual leak of methanol. Uh, but, you know, when life gives you lemons, you just turn the mod on and see if it reacts. Uh, and sure enough, it did, and it made something even heavier. And we scratched our heads for a long time about what this could be. Uh, it's pretty hard to get stuff this heavy in our world. We took every laser we had and just kept shooting it into the chamber, trying to blast it apart. And eventually we did, and what we found is that it was uh, it fragmented into a calcium ion and, uh, and or a, a barium oxide. And so this thing is a molecule, uh, barium, oxygen, calcium. When I first called up Arthur and said, hey, man, I think we got this molecule. It's like an oxygen with two metals on it. He, uh, he made some comment about the California marijuana legalization. Uh, <laughs> because if you know about chemistry, this shouldn't really exist. There are too many electrons, right? Like oxygen wants two electrons. Barium's got two. Those guys are happy. Calcium, the same thing. And so there's sort of, in this case, sort of one electron that doesn't know what to do. Uh, turns out the neutral of this exists well. Okay. So I, I won't, it actually turned out to be a very interesting story of chemistry that I don't have time to go into. But the important uh, thing I want to point out is we learned how to make this. We learned what made it. And we noticed that the structure looked uh, like this. This is sort of, I call it the electron on a stick. Right? So this looks very uh, reminiscent of what you want for sort of the laser coolable molecules. And so the idea here is that, you know, these atomic like electrons, you can do this spam detection. And so we have a, uh, our dream is to get non-destructive spam, you know, like, like James has and Dave Patterson, who many of you know, has a great idea for that as well. Uh, and so we have a collaboration now. I like to call it the electron on a stick collaboration uh, with a lot of people that many of you know and maybe don't know, uh, but are phenomenal people. Okay. All right. So in the last five, four minutes, let me talk a little bit about the thing I'm really excited about, and that is this dipole phonon quantum logic. All right, so imagine you have an atom and a molecule in a trap. The molecule has two states that are split by delta, right? So we have some Hamiltonian delta over two, sigma z, right? Now, and these are dipole, these are, you know, connected by an E1 transition, right? So there's a D dot E term. Now, the ion trap has an electric field, right, as we heard about. And that electric field, you can... It's, it's, the, you know, it's the sum of the ion trap plus the other ions, but you get some you know, harmonic potential of one half m omega squared, x squared, and there's one of those for every one of the phonon modes. Right? And you could just differentiate that to figure out what the electric field is. So you take that electric field, you put it in here, you replace d with sigma x, uh, and what you find is effectively a James Cummings Hamiltonian that's a coupling between the dipole motion or the dipole of the molecule and the phonon motion in the ion trap, right? And so if you get this delta close to one of these omegas, sort of all hell breaks loose. Um, and you can do some pretty cool stuff. For, for example, one of them is a, maybe a simple way of doing quantum logic spectroscopy. So imagine, uh, so this, imagine one of these Second, one of the normal modes of the ion crystal is somewhat close to the molecular ion delta, the internal state splitting. If I start with this, and this axis is for that, uh, that trap frequency, which I can control just with the DC voltage. Right? So let me start with it low so that it's below delta. 
then my eigenstates here, where I'm going to label the molecule as G or E, and the phonon number as just the number, right? I have G0, G1, E1, E0. As I increase omega, the energy of G1 just grows because that's the harmonic oscillator, right? It just grows linearly. But when delta gets close to omega, this coupling uh, splits these and the crossings avoided. So what I can do is start with delta below, or omega below delta. I can ground state cool. And like James said, if I happen to be in the state that I want to be in, and that would be the E0 state, I could then just increase my end caps. And if I do it adiabatically, what I do is I force the molecular excitation to disappear and appear as a phonon. I can then ground state cool, and then I have heralded preparation of G0. And now all I've done is just change an end cap voltage and done laser cooling. Um, I don't have time to talk about it, but there are versions of a Molmer gate, which is sort of the Molmer Sorensen gate is sort of one of the, you know, the crucial ingredients of trapped ion quantum information uh, because it, it's almost completely independent of the phonon number. So there's a version of that that allows you to do atom molecule entanglement. There's an effective molecule molecule entanglement where you can change from spin models that are basically all to all coupling to one over R cubed. Um, there's a way to do microwave to atom transduction, which is a big deal in quantum information right now. It's really hard to put a microwave into a trapped ion, trapped atomic ion, uh, you know, sort of coherently. And you may say, if you know about molecules, and all of you do, um, well, you know, these trap frequencies are never more than 10 megahertz, really. So, you know, molecule sp splittings at 10 megahertz are pretty rare. It turns out it's not so bad, actually. Uh, a lot of omega doublets, it turns out that all the EDM molecules are sort of perfect for this. I think we might first try it in thorium fluoride. It's like almost has everything we want. Uh, these L doublets that, that Nick and others have talked about, uh, all are right in this range. And then there's all sorts of tops, which Dave Patterson knows all about. All right, so with that, I'll end. Um, what I want you guys to remember is atomic ions, those guys can't do it all, and we need to help them. Um, we've been working on how to tame molecules. Spam is hard, but we're working on it. And there's a, maybe a pretty exciting way of doing quantum logic now uh, using this dipole phonon coupling. Thank you. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you're bringing phonons back in. So, I say everything in moderation. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that's a, that's a really good point. Like, my sort of dream is that you have a chip for the molecule-molecule quantum logic, and you use this safer state readout. So, you're never dealing with more than a couple. Right, yeah, so I mean, so Omega could get up to about a megahertz pretty easily. So it's, it looks like it's not so hard. Uh, yeah, which we were surprised by. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we actually added a, uh, there are these piezo doser valves. They're like super slow, but they have like real, they can like keep almost UHV on one side. And so now we can create stuff on demand after that. Uh, it's pretty cool. So I'm misunderstanding something. Probably not. Oh, there is, except we just laser cool it to where it's so small. I see. So it's just that one, one. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, so it, it gets you down to, say, say the Doppler limit's about a millikelvin. Then you still have a millikelvin of broadening. But the axis here was sort of Kelvin. Uh, so it's, yeah.
No, that's a good point. I should put that clear. Yeah, we could go up to about 120 Kelvin right now. Um, the, and the, that is with the waveforms we have. So there's this field of sort of optimal control of like how you like, and if we were to do that, I, I bet you could go a lot higher. We just didn't. Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. Right. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe we'll think harder about yeah, the optimal yeah, control. Well, ions are easier. Yeah. Like, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, James and I, we, we, gave, we went to the dark side a long time ago. <laughs> Never looked back. Yeah. Awesome. All right, thank you.
This. So, okay, whoever texted me, <laughs> let me know if it worked. <laughs> Okay, so uh, coming back, uh, here we have uh, uh, omega equal one states, which means that uh, 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 they have uh, omega doublets uh, as rotational states with uh, two different uh, parities. And actually, I, am, I was very proud that uh, Zelewinski and uh, her collaborators, they were the first to uh, observe the transitions from uh, the E parity levels to the F parity levels with delta G equal, equal zero. While this was not the first uh, measurement of this kind uh, in the world, this was observed earlier by the other spectroscopists, this was the first uh, measurement of such uh, uh, high uh, quality. Moreover, we are very happy to, uh, to say that uh, some uh, spectroscopists <laughs> working on strontium believe that this transition is strictly forbidden and uh, actually is, um, it is uh, allowed. Okay. Well, uh, this, these are potential energy curves in the, in the Gerade manifold. And uh, if you think that I showed the Gerade manifold, this must, uh, must be a very good reason for this. And this good reason is that, uh, uh, these good friends from uh, Columbia observed some mystery levels. And they are really mystery levels for uh, many reasons. One reason is that uh, they took the, data in the spectral region that we thought that we know everything about. So we didn't expect to observe anything in this region. But they observed. So that's, uh, and the, the observation was, uh, they could repeat it uh, many times and, uh, and uh, the signal was there. The second is that uh, the transition strength for this uh, transition was very small. It was about 1,000 times uh, smaller than uh, the transition strength for any transitions observed before. And then we had to explain somehow uh, where does it come uh, from, what, what is the kind of, kind of transition. So, uh, so on the theory side, uh, we made a conjecture that uh, these uh, newly observed transitions are doubly forbidden uh, transitions from uh, Gerade to Gerade states, which, which are uh, magnetic dipole or electric quadruple in origin. But, well, this was a bit incompatible with the fact that the lifetimes of uh, these newly observed uh, states were very short, uh, at least very short to uh, to, uh, as compared to possible radiative lifetimes. So we were faced with two problems and, uh, well, we had to understand uh, what's going on and uh, why uh, we get such a result. So first of all, well, the first comparison is uh, the, to compute the energy levels and then uh, uh, compare uh, the theory and experiment. And the first number they sent was 316. Well, we do the calculations, 315, bingo. And then, then of course, you see that uh, I could say bingo for, <laughs> for all other measurements, but, uh, but well, the crucial was, was this one because this was first observed and, uh, and, uh, well, we saw that if, if we get uh, 316, then we get all others, and, and this indeed became true. So this was the first indication that uh, we really observe these uh, doubly forbidden transitions. But, uh, well, uh, we go on uh, with, uh, and check uh, more carefully whether this is true. So another check that we could do are uh, the linear and uh, quadruple Zeeman shifts, and again, we compare theory with experiment for the linear and for the quadratic. And you see that the agreement is uh, just perfect. So we are sure that uh, what we get uh, are indeed uh, the transitions from the Gerade to uh, Gerade. So then uh, we thought that, uh, well, perhaps uh, well, we observe something uh, more serious, more fundamental. And uh, we believe that, uh, that this is true. And uh, we introduced uh, a new classification of the uh, states. Well, we, such this, 
subradiant and subradiant. And these subradiant are such that the electronic transition moment is just proportional to the atomic one. Okay? And the subradiant, that is, this is uh, new, uh, are very specific because the electronic transition moment, which is molecular, is non zero, but the atomic is strictly zero. Okay? So the atomic is strictly forbidden by at any level of the theory. So would you apply QED or whatever you wish, it will be always zero. Okay? So what does it mean, in fact, that, well, for a super radiant, we have two atoms that uh, uh, the decay rate is gamma, okay? And for the molecule, the decay rate is two gamma. Okay? So this is super radiance because gamma is multiplied by two. And then subradiance means that the atomic transition is strictly forbidden, but all of a sudden the molecular transition is allowed. And, uh, well, if you analyze what kind of mechanism can it be for super radiant, it's obvious that it must be E1, so this is electric uh, uh, dipole transition. And uh, for this sub radiant, this is M1 and E2, so this is magnetic dipole and uh, electric quadrupole. And, well, if you take uh, the experimental situation that we analyzed, you will fully agree with me that there is no way that triplet P1, atomic triplet P1 decays via M1 or E2 mechanism to singlet S. Whatever kind of uh, theory we apply. Okay, and this is nicely illustrated that, uh, well, in fact, in the case of uh, E1, we go from Gerade, which is uh, uh, symmetric, to Ungerade, which is anti-symmetric. One in the case of uh, uh, M1 and T2, we go from Gerade to Gerade, and we, we have selection rules, of course, delta J equals zero or one, delta J equals zero one, uh, uh, delta J equal one and delta J equal uh, one two. Okay, and well, the final check was uh, uh, the transition strengths because I told you that they are thousand times smaller than uh, uh, for uh, the transitions to Ungerade. And here is the comparison between uh, theory and experiment, and I believe that that uh, it's uh, absolutely fantastic. Well, one thing to mention is that uh, these transition moments turned out, turned out to be proportional to uh, the interatomic distance. This is something that uh, Beatrice Busserie-Envo and myself der derived many years ago. And uh, it was published in molecular physics uh, just because this was a nice math. <laughs> but we never expected that anybody would <laughs> would uh, observe it. And uh, yeah, Tania Zalewinski and her team uh, were clever enough to uh, to uh, observe this uh, linear dependence on on R, but then we are left with this, uh, these uh, unexpected unexpectedly short lifetimes uh, compared to a radiative lifetime, and then uh, of course some knowledge of molecular spectroscopy uh, was necessary to understand that uh, they are due due to uh, the what is called the gyroscopic predissociation, which is the uh, essentially the rotational coupling between uh, uh, the continuum of the zero G minus with the bound states of, uh, of uh, one G. And uh, if, we, if we take into account uh, this uh, 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 rotational predissociation, here is what we get, uh, what we get for the lifetimes, full line is uh, theory. And uh, then we have the experimental points. So uh, again, uh, we believe that we fully explain uh, we fully explained uh, uh, what was observed uh, in the experiment. And for comparison, uh, these are uh, radiative uh, radiative lifetimes, which are much smaller than what was observed in the experiment. Okay, so this was a nice work, but uh, well, Tanya always wanted to uh, to do chemistry. I always wanted to do uh, physics. 
Well, let me tell you that if, when my colleagues from chemistry, they ask me what is the molecule that I work uh, on, I say strontium, the reaction is... <laughs> so, uh, uh, so the next experiment was, <laughs> was chemistry. Uh, and, uh, well, indeed, uh, photodissociation, this is a purely chemical process. Uh, you, you cannot uh, think about uh, photodissociation of, uh, of atoms. Uh, unless you think about the fission process. So, uh, so uh, this is uh, something uh, purely, purely chemical. We have uh, bound molecules, we apply a laser field, uh, we get atoms, and we look, uh, we look at the angular distribution of atoms. So uh, one could say nothing special, since uh, the photodissociation experiments are, are uh, done uh, uh, since uh, early 1970s, but uh, well, as I told you, this is a very clever group of uh, experimentalists, and uh, the nice feature of this experiment is uh, it was fully state resolved. Fully state resolved that is that they started with uh, a given angular momentum and its projection. Okay, so we had a full control over the initial state, and uh, well, this full control led uh, to some very unusual results. So perhaps I will uh, skip this because, uh, well, let me tell you that what we get is just the projection of the uh, Newton sphere uh, on the plane. And, uh, well, this reflects the angular distribution of the photodissociated uh, uh, atoms in the uh, laboratory system of access. Okay, and uh, until uh, we we did this uh, this work. It was uh, usual to uh, to apply the the semi-classical model uh, uh, to describe this angular distribution. This is a model due to Zer and Bernstein, and actually you see that this is uh, one parameter model with uh, uh, beta two is a, a symmetry parameter, and then we have just dependence on p two, which gives us uh, a cylindrical uh, distribution of atoms after the photodissociation. Well, actually, if you do quantum chemistry, then, uh, well, you, you apply the uh, uh, Fermi Golden Rule, and then it leads to a more complicated, uh, more complicated uh, expression. However, this expression can be simplified to this, this one uh, un under some, uh, some constraints. So, uh, but, Actually, it turned out that uh, in our case, uh, these constraints did not work, so we had to use the full uh, Fermi-Golden rule uh, expression, and this is a kind of uh, agreement that, uh, that we got. So let me tell you that the green dots meet, means agreement between uh, the formula of Zer and Bernstein and the quantum, fully quantum mechanical. And the red means disagreement. And you see that uh, we, well, you may say that this is my pre-selection, -pre but, but believe me that we have uh, very few, uh, very few uh, yellow, po uh, green points, and uh, mostly uh, red points, which means that in most of cases uh, uh, the semi-classical uh, theory did not agree uh, with experiment. So uh, this is actually the experiment. Uh, sorry, this is the experiment, and then uh, if you uh, if you look. Uh, at this column, this is uh, theory, and you see that uh, there is a perfect agreement between uh, between uh, theory and experiment. And actually, uh, well, this is the end of the strontium story from my side. But for those who are interested by uh, photodissociation in the magnetic field or or uh, uh, application of quasi-classical uh, theory to, to the photodissociation, and uh, we were both very successful in this uh, in this area. I, I invite these people to uh, to see the poster by uh, Ivona Majewska tonight, and then of course the strontium works work goes on, and they work very hard in Colombia. Although we were also work hard in Warsaw. <laughs> And uh, then Stan will, uh, uh, tomorrow Stan will, uh, Stan Kondov will uh, report some, some very interesting and uh, very unusual data. And, uh, well, 
I think that it will be up, up to him to, uh, to uh, tell the secrets. Uh, and uh, but uh, it's uh, really fantastic. So uh, well, you may say that uh, okay, the title was new physics, but uh, in fact it was a new molecular physics. And uh, this is true. We are modest people, and uh, we start with uh, with the simplest. But uh, now we decided that uh, okay, if we can understand very well uh, uh, some. Uh, quite sophisticated mo molecular physics, then perhaps we can go on and uh, search for some uh, really new new physics, especially that, uh, well, we started to have uh, new tools uh, both in uh, theory and uh, in experiment, and perhaps we'll be able to to get something interesting. And this something interesting is, uh, well, this uh, extra, extra extra interaction that uh, goes uh, beyond the standard model. And uh, this interaction, you see that it has a Yukawa type uh, 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 mathematical form. Let me tell you that uh, this constant A is not necessarily small. Okay, so it can be large. And this uh, lambda, interestingly, is of the same order as the distance uh, between uh, the strontium atoms in the ground state. So this means that perhaps with uh, molecular spectroscopy we can uh, we can uh, get some information uh, if we do uh, sufficiently uh, precise uh, uh, measurements and uh, and uh, we interpret them with uh, state of the art models uh, the best that uh, that uh, we can apply. So uh, well, and actually the plan is the the following. So. Uh, uh, well, the total energy well is composed of many many terms: the, the Born-Oppenheimer potential, then some mass-dependent terms, well, but independent uh, on the fine structure constant, then some relativistic terms, uh, and then some recoil terms uh, that depend on the on the fine structure and uh, the uh, nuclear mass, then the QED, uh, etc. But uh, it turns out that in Warsaw uh, we know how to compute all these terms, and, and actually, actually we, we are in a pretty good position because we have the codes to, uh, to uh, I would say, to, uh, to get, well, perhaps not all of them, but 90% of, uh, of them. Which means that uh, from a Benicia we, we, uh, we will get some pretty precise information about what happens beyond the born Oppenheimer? Okay, of course, nobody claims that uh, ab initio will be precise to uh, the Hertz level. However, first of all, ab initio is very good because uh, you know it gives you the right order of magnitude, so it fixes something. And you well, when you then do the fitting to the experiment, uh, well, you know for sure that uh, it. Some terms cannot change by 50% uh, just because if uh, ab initio gives uh, one, then you expect that uh, the deviation will be one, zero, one, or something like this. But uh, you don't expect uh, big, big changes. And then the nice, uh, nice feature is that uh, for bosonic, uh, uh, bosonic uh, isotopes, so we have three. Which gives six combinations of uh, diatomic molecules, and with the data, and uh, Tanya promised uh, to cover the full, uh, full well depth for all, all possible isotopic combinations. Then uh, we need only only five to fit, okay, and we leave the six to check uh, well what we get from the fit, At, uh, and uh, well, we can get two kinds of uh, deviations. So one is uh, exponential in R, and uh, well, this will uh, this will suggest that we have the fifth force. Well, then the, the deviation uh, can be inversely proportional to some power of the internuclear distance, and then it will mean that we miss some higher order QED. Well, I must say that. Whatever we get, uh, it will be very interesting, and uh, and uh, it will be really new uh, uh, for 
molecular physics. So, and uh, of course, our goal. So, this is uh, the blue part is pre the pre theoretical prediction ba based on uh, the assumption that we describe this uh, electroweak uh, this new electroweak interaction as the exchange of uh, two light bosons, which in uh, high energy physics at Weizmann they call them relaxions. I like very much the name of this boson. So, uh, so this is the prediction of theory. These are the experiments based on different, uh, different, uh, uh, very different techniques. And uh, yeah, this is what in pink. Uh, this is what we hope to cover with uh, our joint experimental and theoretical work. And relax. I thank you for your attention. Well, what was observed in uh, H2+, plus, so this is the experiment by Carrington, this was the GU mixing due, due to a short-range uh, uh, hyperfine interaction. But we don't have any hyperfine interaction in strontium, so, uh, so actually the, the GU mixing is uh, strictly forbidden in strontium, just because the nuclear spin is equal to zero. While the term that, uh, that uh, mixes uh, G, G and U, this is, uh, if I remember, the scalar product of uh, spin one times uh, spin two, and then you have uh, uh, instead of then, then you have an uh, uh, anti-symmetric. Uh, uh, so uh, the difference of the deltas of the position on nuclei I and uh, nuclei B, yeah, and this causes the GU mixing because uh, the because the operator is not uh, not symmetric with respect to the positions of the nuclei. But uh, in our case, since there is no spin, uh, this operator is just zero. Yeah, but in the ground state, the spin is zero, so... If you take, uh, in the yeah, but it is a single state. But, uh, the, the yeah, but the tri for the triple state, the spin rotation was included. This is uh, this is quite uh, obvious. I mean, this is standard. You mean the, the electronic structure theory? Uh, yeah, well, uh, well uh, no, uh, actually, it's okay. I have a part of my group working on the development of uh, quantum chemistry code, codes. And, uh, well, actually, this, these codes are, well, are uh, dedicated to the, the exp mostly dedicated to the experiments that uh, uh, Tanya is running. It's just quantum chemistry is a kind of applied field, and if you do developments, then uh, then it's good to uh, to have uh, something in mind uh, so that people uh, uh, use uh, or we use uh, ourselves. So so uh, this is uh, uh, 
This is one thing. The data that you got from uh, fr the data that you got from Rosario on NACS. This was also the data obtained with some very specific codes uh, that are not uh, commercially available, and uh, and actually they can. This is a kind of calculations that can only be done in War in Warsaw and uh, perhaps uh, into other places in Poland. So. So, and I hope that these data were useful for you. All right, we have one last question, maybe. Otherwise, I would suggest we move on, since we have to be on time and moving out here. So, thanks a lot for the nice presentation. <laughs>Hi, uh, so can everybody hear me? Okay, so I'm Yuval Shagam. I'm a postdoc with uh, Juni and Eric Cornell. Uh, and uh, I'd also like to thank, of course, the organizers for inviting me to, to give this talk. Um, and today I'm going to tell you about the second generation measurement of, uh, that we're planning to do on the EDM with trapped molecular ions. And basically, the talk is going to be about the state preparation and the readout that we have uh, revamped in this version or spam or spar, I guess, in this case. So, since uh, we already heard a very short introduction from uh, uh, Dave DeMille and an even faster uh, motivation from Nick Hutzler, I'm going to try to go even faster about the motivation here. And uh, basically, we have some mysteries in our universe, namely the matter-antimatter asymmetry. And uh, there is just uh, not enough CP symmetry violation in the standard model to explain them. And so we've created some extensions to the standard model, which have much more CP violation. And these, uh, the, this CP violation can only also manifest itself as a uh, permanent dipole moment for elementary particles, such as the electron. And so by measuring this, uh, this quantity very precisely, we're actually able to uh, constrain some of these extensions to the standard model. And here you see our measurement at 10 to the minus 28 charge uh, centimeters, uh, which is about a factor of 12 worse than the best uh, measurement in the world that was done right here at Harvard and within the Harvard-Yale collaboration uh, in the ACME 2 paper, which is about, as I said, a factor of 12 better. So that gives you some motivation about measuring these things. So how would we measure it? Well, if we had a bare electron, well, we would want to apply a magnetic field, and we would be able to do a spin resonance measurement on it and see a frequency. If this electron also had a dipole moment and we applied an electric field uh, to it, the line would shift to one side. And if we flip the direction of the electric field, the line would shift to the other side. And we could measure these two frequencies. And from the, their difference, we would be able to extract the EDM. So naturally, we want this electric field to be as large as possible so we, that we can separate these li two lines as much as possible. And we want the coherence time to be uh, also very long because this allows us to see these lines as very narrow objects. And we also like, would like to have a lot of statistics. And a lot of statistics would help us find the exact center point of these Gaussians very accurately. So the optimal figure of merit at the shot noise limit ends up scaling inversely with the effective electric field applied to this electron and uh, with a coherence time n as 1 over the square root of the number. And this is going to follow us throughout the talk. So why should we use um, um, molecules? Well, we already had plenty of motivation for this. 
Uh, and it's because they, through relativistic enhancement uh, of specific molecules, we can get effective electric fields that are in the order of tens of gigavolts per centimeter, which is much larger than anything that we can create in the lab. Uh, and this is all when we, we uh, apply a very modest electric field to them. But why should we use molecular ions uh, in this case? Well, I think James gave us a clue about this when he said that they're easy to trap. We've been trapping molecular ions, or, well, ions in general, for some decades now. And so if we have a very narrow uh, transition, we would be able to probe it for very long times and be, get access to uh, long coherence times. In our case, in hafnium fluoride, it's going to be as long as three seconds. Uh, so if we compare the, some of the recent measurements of the uh, EDM from different experiments, we see in the top rows, we see uh, beam experiments, which are limited to a certain distance due to the speed of the molecular beam. And so you see coherence times of a, a few milliseconds. And we're doing extremely well in our last measurement uh, at many hundreds of milliseconds, and we're going to improve of the, uh, on that in this measurement. So you must be thinking, well, we should be killing it in, in our measurement. But as you can see, we're not. We're well behind uh, the best uh, measurement uh, in the world. And the reason is, you can see it from the next column, uh, where we're getting completely blown out of the water in the number department. And I think the number 10 over here is also pretty optimistic. It's more like seven. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we're going to uh, try and work at improving this thing. And I also, at this point, want to mention some of the other experiments that are warming up with uh, the triatomic uh, measurements. And we also heard from Rick about the barium fluoride measurements. And Amar Vutha is going to do a, uh, a measurement also of molecules in a crystal, I believe. Uh, so since James already showed you our experimental setup in his first slide, I'm just going to jump into the level diagram. So we started with a cold molecular beam of hafnium fluorides, uh, neutrals, and we use a near threshold REMP ionization to ionize them so that we, they wind up in the ground state of hafnium fluoride plus in a few different rotational states. We then stop this, uh, these molecular ions and begin trapping them in our trap. We then use a two-photon Raman transition uh, to uh, transfer these molecules into the triple delta-1 state, which has uh, this omega doubling or co-magnetometer effect that we'll talk about that we already heard about yesterday. And this is going to be the state that's going to be have the EDM sensitivity that we're going to use, uh, mainly because it has a very uh, low magnetic dipole moment. So let's zoom on this state. and. If there's no electric field applied, we see that we have uh, these uh, lambda doublet states in here. And we're just going to ignore these two states in the middle uh, because they only play a secondary role. And we're just going to call these the spin up and spin down states. So if we apply an electric field to these states, well, we can begin uh, mixing these two parity states and creating states of good orientation of the molecule. So the top two states we're going to call the upper doublet, where the molecule is oriented in, the, in one direction. And in the bottom two states, uh, it's going to be ori oriented in the other direction. Uh, and we're going to use this uh, as uh, I think Dave DeMille proposed uh, as our two co-magnetometer states uh, for the measurement. Now, I'm sure there's someone in the back that's saying, well, didn't you say this is an ion? How are you applying an electric field to an ion? shouldn't uh, be flying away. And it's true, ions are amazing at finding the region with zero field. And the way that we do it, so if we were to apply an electric field to it, the ion would most likely uh, fly out of the trap even for a modest electric field. So the way that we do it is we apply a, an electric field that's rotating just fast enough so the, that the molecule cannot escape uh, from our trap. So everything is done in a rotating frame of reference, and this also introduces some couplings between the different hyperfine states. So now I've added this E rot uh, subscript up here. Uh, so now you know what that is. So 
if we apply a magnetic field to this, the spin-up states are going to shift up, and the spin-down states are going to shift uh, down, of course. And we're going to be able to measure these two frequencies. Now, we need to remember that the effective electric field that's applied to the electron is going to be oriented with the uh, orientation of the molecule. So it'll be in opposite directions in the uh, upper doublet and in the lower doublet. And then the electron, EDM, is going to be oriented with the spin. So it's going to be oriented in opposite directions in the spin up and spin down case. So effectively, these cause, this causes the two states in the upper doublet to move slightly further apart and the two states in the lower doublet to move closer together. Uh, well, depending on the sign of the EDM, which we don't know. So far, it's consistent with zero. Uh, and so, if we were to measure the energy difference between the upper two doublets and the lower two doublets, and take the difference of that, we should be able to extract the EDM uh, from it. So, how do we do our measurement? Well, we begin by creating our ions and preparing them in a single one of these four states, we then apply our pi over two pulses and let the, the system spin process. Uh, and when we stop, we may find them in an equal number in, in the two uh, spin up and spin down states. We then project our state uh, by kicking out one of these uh, spin states into Hilbert space. Uh, and then we proceed to dissociate our molecule, the, this entire state state selectively, and kick it out onto the MCP. Uh, and, uh, and then we can detect the hafnium uh, photo fragment by time of flight mass spectrometry, and the number of hafniums that will uh, count will depend on, will be basically proportional to the number that we're actually in the state. And so we can do these, this for, these, uh, for both of these spin up and spin down states, and for the upper doublet, and we can extract Ramsey fringes that look something like this with a coherence time of around 700 milliseconds. Uh, and so up until now, there hasn't been really anything uh, new with this. Uh, but as I said before, we really want to uh, improve the ion number, the count rate that we have in the experiment. And for this, we built a much bigger trap with much more uniform fields so that we can uh, trap a, the ions in a much larger volume while we apply an electric field to them. And also, we revamped our electronics to be able to apply a much stronger polarizing uh, uh, electric field. And this helps us uh, keep down some berry phase effects that cause us to dephase through collisions between ions. Uh, and the other thing that we had to do is now that our count rate was about a factor of 20 or 30 or I think even 50 higher, is we had to switch to counting our ions by imaging, where instead of counting them in time of flight, we would see spots for the individual ions, and we would be able to count the number of spots. And the reason I'm showing this is because this is going to allude to something that I'm going to get to uh, later in the talk, that you see that the ions are actually breaking up into an interesting spatial pattern uh, that looks like uh, two blobs. Uh, so. The immediate gain uh, from these improvements can be seen here. So this is the old fringe, and this is our, uh, what our new fringe looks like. So the first thing that you notice is that our coherence time is much longer. It's in this fringe, it's about 2.4 seconds. The second thing that you notice is that the error bars on these, uh, on these points are much, much smaller. And this is even though we're using a, a very similar number of shots to, uh, to measure this. And this is, of course, a result of the much higher count rate. And basically, th these improvements lead us to uh, uh, an improvement where before, if we had about a millihertz precision in 200 hours, now we can achieve the same precision in 3.2 hours. But the question is, is this enough? And uh, the problem is that to really use these co-magnetometer states uh, efficiently, you really want to be able to switch between the upper doublet and lower doublet as quickly as you can. And we're measuring one state at a time. And of course, this rate is going to go down as we uh, increase our coherence time. And so we'll be very susceptible to drifts in the magnetic field between the two measurements that, uh, that we make. And 
the second uh, issue that we have is that we are using photo dissociation and action spectroscopy technique to detect these, uh, these molecules. And that's, that's very good because it's, you can detect ions at the end of the day uh, with very, very high quantum efficiency. But this, uh, these kinds of action spectroscopy techniques usually carry with them uh, very high uh, fractional noise uh, on our system, fractional technical noise. And uh, this is due to their, them being very spectrally broad and very uh, you know, non-uniform in their power in a shot-to-shot -shot basis. And in our system, we found that our uh, noise actually scales as about 15% of the signal that we have in the system. So for 500 ions, this comes out to about three times shock noise. And you may say, okay, you know, it's only three times shock noise. Well, that's 10 times as much data. So that's a really big deal to average down for 10 times as long uh, for us. And so we really want to be able to beat this, uh, this limit. And sure, you could think about uh, seeding your pulsed uh, dye laser and making it spectrally narrow and uh, think about correlating its power and trying to reduce this noise, but let's think about another idea. What if we were to be able to measure both of these doublets simultaneously? Uh, what would happen if we were to measure for, be able to measure both of these states uh, at the same time? Well, before that, our noise would be uncorrelated. So if you were sitting on the side of the fringe, while well, one shot would be uh, jumping up, the other si uh, shot would be jumping down. And uh, the, uh, this asymmetry that we're calculating here is going to be proportional to uh, the number that we count in as spin up or spin down state, depending on the sign that you choose in there. But uh, if we measure both of the doublets from the same dissociation shot, then this technical noise should be common mode. Both of these fringes would uh, jump up at the same time. And if you remember from before, I mentioned that we're actually only interested in the difference between these two uh, fringes. And so we could subtract these two signals and feed the beat frequency, which should be much lower in noise. The second thing that you notice is that if there is any phase noise that on this fringe, on where we're sitting, it's going to also manifest as, a, as an amplitude noise that's going to be common mode. So if we move the phase off in one direction, uh, the number is going to seem as if it's gone up. And so this should also be common mode for these two measurements. So we now have a lot of motivation on why to do this. Uh, so now it's all simple. We need to do spam. Uh, we need to be able to prepare this state, and we need to be able to detect it simultaneously. So how do we do that? Well, before I mentioned that we were using this uh, off-resonant Raman transition to transfer our ions into either the upper doublet or the lower doublet of this triple delta one state. Well, there's an old trick in the AMO uh, bag of tools, I think, that's known as optical pumping. What if we were to just move this laser onto resonance and choose an electronic state that has a favorable branching ratio into the triple delta one state? And we can also couple all of these rotational states with microwaves fairly easily. And we would be able to get all these molecules to move over into the triple delta one state. OK, that's one step. Uh, now we can apply a second laser on an electron transition that actually likes to cycle uh, over here. Not so much because of the Frank Condon factors, but pretty good. And if we apply this with circular polarization, we can move uh, these uh, molecules into the fully stretched state. So that's great. We've created our ions in the spin-up state. That was easy. We had two lasers before, and we have two lasers now. So I guess the conclusion is that molecules are simple. We've cooled our molecules into two quantum states. I don't know why June is complaining about YO being so difficult to laser cool. Uh, well, there's a reason. And the reason is that there are all these different vibrational states and rotational states over here where our molecules could disappear into Hilbert space. And and actually, I'm, I'm like, I, we, if we zoom in, it looks like this. If you, if you add the hyperfine structure and uh, the parity structure into it. Well, 
if we choose our uh, transitions uh, to be uh, in a wise way, uh, depending on the different rotational lines, and we also add two lasers over here to clean up anything that would come back. So if you have a two-second coherence time, yeah, everything that disappeared into the Hilbert space is going to come back and hurt you later on. Uh, well, we can solve this problem, and I'm going to half ask you to trust me on this for now because I want to move on. So we've now uh, managed to prepare a single spin state in both doublets, and we can apply our pi over 2 pulses uh, to it and, uh, and measure uh, and have a fringe uh, appear in both of these. But we still need to be able to detect these two states uh, independently. And the problem here is that we were using two-photon dissociation before, and we were going through a state that had no orientation. And so even though our molecule had a good orientation here, this orientation would disappear in the intermediate state, and it would come out completely mixed. So we did some spectroscopy uh, with the help of Tanya Zelovinsky. We found that if we have an oriented intermediate state, our photofragments are going to be oriented in space. And what this results in is one of these doublets appears on one side of our detector, and the other doublet appears on the other side of the detector. And I'm a little bit embarrassed that these aren't as beautiful as the pictures that Robert showed us before that Tanya took, but I think they're pretty good for us. Uh, and there's a tiny bit of overlap that I won't get into yet. And there's one more thing that I've been hiding from you so far, and that's that the G factor is actually not exactly the same in the upper doublet and in the lower doublet. So that means that we're going to be measuring two different frequencies on the left side of our detector and on the right side of the detector. And so if we look at our resulting Ramsey fringe, we see that uh, at early time they are both in phase, and at about 750 milliseconds they go out of phase, coming back into phase at uh, one and a half seconds in this case. And, okay, that's, that's pretty good. That uh, looks like a good Ramsey fringe. We've succeeded in our spam. So how does this help us? Well, if we were to naively look at our error bars on each individual fringe uh, separately, well, we would see that we, are, we would find that our standard deviation on these points corresponds to these blue lines, which is well above the shot noise limit, which is uh, the quantum projection noise limit which is depicted by the dashed lines that you see all the way down here. But we know that we don't have to take our uh, standard deviation this way. We're actually only interested in the differences. So if for each individual point we are first to take the difference between the two points, we would find that our standard deviation is now much lower and pretty much at the quantum projection noise limit. And we're fairly certain that we know what limits us from hitting the quantum projection noise limit, then we can, on a given day, make it better and uh, have it really reach the quantum projection noise limit. So you notice that I didn't show you what's going on here in the out-of-phase measurements. Well, let's think about it first. What will happen in the out-of-phase measurement? Well, if we have number noise, the number is going up and down, that's going to be common mode even when we're out of phase. But if we have any sort of phase noise on this, it's actually going to manifest itself as an opposite direction uh, number noise. And so the noise would not cancel in this case. So if we look at the results, yeah, we see that we are well above the quantum projection noise limit. There is some technical noise cancellation here, but we're still well above it. But this also alludes to uh, us, if we measure our, our EDM signal when we're back in phase, this is a noise that would, should cancel and we wouldn't have to deal with. And this tells you how much noise we wouldn't have to deal with just by taking our measurements when the two, uh, when the two doublets are in, back in phase. Uh, and so how am I doing on time? Great. Oh, I went fast. Okay. So basically the point of all of this is that, well, we could only achieve two-state detection uh, in our system. And 
This actually turns out to be almost as, as good as four-state detection. If we had four-state detection, we would be able to detect our EDM signal at any time. But this puts a little bit of a constraint on us where we have to wait for the fringes to be in phase, but that's not so bad. We can uh, tune most of these frequencies and use this uh, two-state detection to be at the quantum projection noise limit. And so if you take a look at our sensitivity today, well, we haven't fully optimized our data taking yet, but it is on the order of a millihertz per root hour. Uh, and you can compare this number to the ACME uh, 2 limit at, the, at this point and see that it's very comparable. And we hope to be able to improve this a little bit. But we've achieved this by uh, going to 2.4 seconds of coherence time, uh, which is fairly typical in our experiment, although not lately, and we're not sure why. Uh, but the uh, <laughs> Uh, but the uh, ion number has also grown, and the other thing that I didn't talk about is that our contrast has also, our fringe contrast has improved to about 0 0.8 from 0 0.6. Uh, and if I have more time, uh, well, I also mentioned that Will, who's sitting out in the crowd, will be giving a great poster today, and, uh, and I guess uh, I, I'll also mention the next generation of uh, EDM measurements that will use thorium fluoride. And basically, when I showed you this optimal, uh, optimal limit uh, to the EDM sensitivity, uh, well, you see that it scales as 1 over the coherence time. And with our next generation molecule of thorium fluoride, uh, where this science state, this triple delta 1 state, is the ground state, we expect to be able to reach with some cryogenic cooling coherence times of about 60 seconds. But the actual, uh, the effective uh, sensitivity to the EDM, well, is going to not exactly scale like that because as we increase our coherence time, if we're using a single trap, our count rate is going to decrease with the coherence time. And so we'll actually only be gaining by the square root of the, of the gain of the coherence time, which isn't a lot. It's about a factor of five above this. But we can uh, make another improvement, and really our lasers are pulsing at about 10 hertz. So we have a lot of dead time where we're not using our lasers. So you could think about separating our uh, ion creation and ion detection chambers, and in the middle having a conveyor belt to move our ions from one side to the other. And so we can create these uh, little buckets of ions that are spin processing and taking their sweet time spin processing uh, and, and be able to really increase our, our uh, rep rate and really achieve this, uh, this optimal uh, case where we expect to see maybe a factor of 50 further gain in sensitivity to the EDM. And so with that, uh, this is a picture of, of the group. Uh, I'd like to thank Eric and June uh, and so the people working on the hafnium fluoride are uh, Will, Tanya, and Tanner, uh, who are pictured here. Will is giving a poster today. I mentioned that again. This is Tanya, and Tanner is uh, photoshopped into the picture. Not well, very well photoshopped. Uh, and we have some past EDMers who are sitting in the crowd, and, uh, uh, and also some temporary EDMers there. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Yes. And have you identified any possible systematic errors due to correlations of the movement of that cut with any of your switches? Uh, what we call switches is, you know, just for the whole line, so we call switches is changing something like the direction of the electric field or the, the orientation of the molecule. That, of course, is like a super dangerous systematic. If, for example, with our B field switch, this, the contrast or this cut were to change in any way. And we haven't, we, this is like the next thing on our list to study at this point. Uh, but yeah, we're very worried about that. That's, uh, but we kind of have a feeling that it'll work. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it's very nice that you had closed phase smart music, but 
the also from the present it looks like you only get the contrast from uh environment from the same quadrature. Did I just switch between the two quadrature of the same? Uh, so y you're talking about uh, the fact that uh, when we measure these two uh, these states, we're only measuring the spin uh, down states at the same time, and not the spin up states at the same time. Yeah. Yes. So so this is true, uh, and this makes it so that the noise doesn't uh, cancel away, except when uh, these two uh, different uh, fringes are exactly are in phase. And so this is why we don't actually need uh, to detect all four states at the same time. Uh, but of course, four state detection would be better. Yeah, the most natural thing about detecting the both quadrants simultaneously instead of detecting. Oh, you're talking about detecting these two states at the same time, or or these the top two ones. Yeah. So. If we were to, uh, well, the first thing is that uh, we cannot uh, do that. But if we were able to uh, detect these two states, yes, you would get uh, all the technical noise canceling at the same time. But uh, the magnetic field noise would actually uh, not cancel as well. And, and so it's actually better to, uh, to measure the, the two doublets separately as opposed to measuring only the top states. We were actually confused about this for some time, about uh, how it's actually the same. Uh, but it turns out that when you're on the side of the fringe in both of uh, the doublets, well, the population is actually approximately the same, should be approximately the same in all four of these states. And that's why it allows uh, all of the, these things to, uh, to come about, where we can cancel everything. It's just because under the approximation that it, the numbers are the same in all four of these states, we can really spy on these different states with just the two states that we can measure. I don't know if that's clear, but we can talk about it later. I have two questions. One is the technical, the other one is the general question. The technical question is for this MCP detection, you have so many ions uh, on the MCP. Um, I remember MCP can have a bad time. You can only one for each, for a fixed time. How do you uh, get a around about that? So, for an MCP, right, that dead time is really going to be uh, per pore. So, if you spread your ions on a big area on the MCP, you only really have like a local dead time. And we do find that we get close to saturating the MCP, but not with the hafnium signal. Uh, which is of about a thousand ions. It's, we actually saturate the MCP with the roughly 20 or 30,000 hafnium fluorides that arrive right after this. Uh, but we've characterized this saturation fairly well, and so we can measure both the hafnium fluorides and the hafnium, uh, hafniums at the same time. But it's, this is many shots. This isn't a, a single shot. This is about uh, 20 shots uh, that are averaged down. But, uh, you would have about uh, 1,000 to 1,500 ions in a single shot uh, imaged. Okay. My general question is, uh, for the ACME 2 experiment, we use uh, like a fluorescence detection, right? Here is the ionization detection. How do you guys choose this different method, and which one is the more efficient one? <laughs> so, all right, it's a question of uh, the numbers uh, that you have. I think that... Uh, Right here, we, it's a question of like the efficiency of your dissociation. Uh, after you dissociate, yes, you can use an MCP to detect with about 80% quantum efficiency uh, the ions that you have. So that is a big plus. But in our case, if we did a calculation for how many photons we can scatter per state, well, we find and with our collection efficiency and with uh, the quantum efficiency of detectors at the wavelengths that would be required, well, we found that it's, uh, it's absolutely laughable relative to the quantum efficiency that we would get from this method. But in the next generation uh, molecule, uh, we've actually found that uh, we can close up enough vibrational states to cycle as many as 100 photons, possibly. And this could make it feasible to uh, to use uh, fluorescence detection on it, although 
that would still not be, so with fluorescence detection, right, you can switch between your spin up and spin down states very quickly, uh, but it's still not exactly simultaneous. So we're actually quite happy with this photo dissociation technique, right, up until we start looking more into the systematics of it, as John mentioned before. I have a stupid question. So, I mean, since you're working with these ion clouds, what about the electric fields between, I mean, is that something, since there's no feelings, that's something we can completely neglect? Uh, between the ions. Yeah, yeah, because that's something that you are determined, like the E-rod you is not the only thing that's going to be there, right, if you're working with these clouds. Yeah, so, so that electric field, uh, it comes in from ion-ion collisions, and it, really shifts our quantization axis every time there's a collision. And so, yes, this will cause decoherence, and, uh, and uh, this is why we need such a big trap to be able to trap our ions and make it like the cloud not quite as dense. So right now, if we really crank up our ion number all the way to, to the limit, yes, you see your coherence time will go down to about a second uh, as opposed to uh, two and a half seconds. Uh, um, but at the same time, it really makes it uh, important to see that uh, uh, the efficiency uh, is very important, right? You want to, so we start with 20,000 ions, and in the end, about 1,000 of them arrive at our detector. So if we are able to state prepare our molecules more efficiently, then uh, we, are le we can put in more molecules in there and be less sensitive to this decoherence, uh, these decoherence effects. Um, and the other thing I guess I should mention about this is that uh, uh, like, uh, we were able to do this uh, optical pumping and state preparation on a molecule that we chose uh, only due to its sensitivity to the EDM. It's not a, it's not a molecule that has particularly good uh, diagonal Frank-Condon factors or anything, but it's still possible to use optical pumping to prepare it. And this works a lot more efficiently about factor of three more efficiently, uh, we're not trying so hard actually to get it uh, really good yet, uh, but it works a lot better than the uh, two-photon Raman transition that we had before a lot more efficiently. All right, great. I think we have to move on, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, polar molecules uh, created approximately at uh, temperatures below one milli, uh, micro Kelvin. So explanation why we would expect uh, interesting phenomena uh, could be due to the fact that de Broglie wavelengths uh, at this kind of temperature is huge. Uh, on this graph, you can see uh, that uh, at temperatures uh, at a few nanokelvin, uh, the de Broglie uh, wavelength is around uh, millimeters. So, and of course, uh, uh, quantum effects would promote quantum tunneling and quantum threshold effects. One of the most interesting questions now, uh, how chemical reaction proceed uh, at uh, temperature near absolute zero? And uh, this question is not hypothetical anymore uh, because uh, ultra-cold molecules uh, in uh, quantum degenerate actually uh, gases of, uh, of fault molecules uh, are already created uh, in a number of experiments and uh, uh, chemical reaction with these gases was studied and the first time it was uh, experiment by GILA group in 2010 uh, and then recently uh, they repeated this experiment with, with much uh, higher better conditions uh, when they consider identical uh, ferromionic potassium rubidium molecules uh, and they measure uh, reaction rate coefficients uh, and they're apparently proportional to temperature which is predicted by uh, Wigner threshold law for P wave collisions. And uh, this behavior shown here by uh, red markers and uh, it corresponds uh, pretty good to predictions of quantum defect theory. Uh, even more, quantum statistics uh, play a role when they even increase decreased temperature, increased density of molecules, and the uh, behavior, uh, uh, these uh, blue uh, markers show um, that reaction even more suppressed uh, uh, in these conditions. However, suppression uh, rate coefficients do not exist when we consider uh, collisions between molecules and atoms. So quantum statistics allow uh, transitions uh, uh, using S-wave S scattering. So uh, in the experiment uh, which investigated uh, molecule atom collisions, we, we can see that rates are about 100 times higher, uh, larger than what the previous slide showing. So it's approximately 10 to minus 10 centimeter cube for second. So another experiment uh, was performed using a sodium lithium molecule in triplet sigma state in absolute uh, vibrational rotational state colliding with lithium and also preliminary they estimated a rate also same order of magnitude. And there is some information about uh, theoretical uh, estimate even using uh, universal rates. Uh, and uh, on this graph you can see that uh, predictions uh, by universal rate uh, agree somehow, not, not very exactly agree, but not far away uh, with experimental measurements. Um, and it means that uh, the reactions of uh, 
alkalic metal molecules with atoms, uh, uh, most likely uh, near universal uh, when almost all molecules going to react and uh, atom exchange process happen uh, and only small part of molecules return back or, you know, collide uh, uh, elastically. So, however, measurements and also predictions by quantum defect models uh, do not describe intermediate scattering complex, uh, what happening during this reaction, and it do not predict raw vibration product distribution. And the uh, importance of these reactions uh, initiate our interest to look at that more precise method, using more accurate methods. So here's a, a simple diagram describing um, different uh, simulation tools used uh, in ke quantum chemistry for uh, solving reactions. Uh, and the uh, yellow color indicates uh, like uh, classically chemic, uh, classical reactions. Uh, which includes the uh, REACTS FF method and molecular dynamics method. Um, but uh, there are sort of major tools uh, for quantum uh, mechanical methods, uh, which include wave packet method and uh, couple channel method. So wave packet normally time dependent and couple channel time independent method. But however, uh, wave packet method um, doesn't work well for now for ultra-cold reactions because wave packet is, is so big uh, for very low temperatures. So practically we cannot um, identify initial state or final state. Uh, that's the purpose of, of the, the study to understand how actually reaction going. So uh, I would say for now we only have one option is couple channels method, uh, which uh, works in, for low temperatures and pretty simple, not very large molecules. So here. Um, I will be talking about uh, our method, and, and this work performed in collaboration with a group of uh, Balan Duval and uh, uh, Brian Kendrick from Lund. So this is exact quantum mechanical method. It, it's uh, called EQM method. Uh, that allows uh, atoms and molecules rotate. Uh, molecules, but mostly uh, rotate, vibrate, and it has a uh, six-dimensional scattering wave function um, in hyperspherical coordinates. So uh, most of the uh, hyper radius are solved uh, in a short range and intermediate range between atom molecule, uh, but asymptotic boundary conditions used in Jacobi coordinate in order to determine scattering matrix and state-to-state uh, -state reaction rates. First, uh, in my talk, I will uh, talk um, about one reaction uh, using born amperheimer approximation. And then later, I will switch uh, to uh, our new approach using beyond Born-Oppenheimer approximation, where we have to use several or two, in this case, uh, potential services which uh, interact uh, and uh, cross each other and have uh, conical intersection. 
So, uh, as I mentioned, um, this method uh, is practically possible to use for uh, small enough molecules. Uh, even for small molecules, what we wanted to consider, uh, it is still a uh, very um, daunting, uh, difficult, challenging problem. Uh, first of all, ultra-cold collisions are very sensitive to details of the potentials, and long range is very important. Uh, and secondly, um, these systems have very deep potentials and many uh, reaction channels, a few thousand normally. So, and the uh, computational cost scales very fast with increase of channels. So, the first um, reaction is uh, potassium rubidium uh, colliding with constituent potassium atom. Uh, and, uh, of course, potassium rubidium molecule in absolute ground state. Uh, so he's uh, on the left, uh, energetics of this reaction. Uh, so we start from V equals zero, J equals zero of potassium rubidium. And then uh, we have uh, like free vibrational states available. And of course, many rotational states could be occupied. So this uh, gray area indicates uh, many rotational states. So here, first, of course, we map up the uh, three-dimensional trimer potentials using, uh, in this case, uh, MRCI method, because in principle, we did calculate two surfaces. But now I talk about born up and harm approximation in one surface. Uh, and there, uh, here is a, like a example I show this surface uh, in um, collinear geometry. In this uh, geometry, you can see entrance and exit kind of channel. Um, and uh, uh, in, in uh, calculation of potential surface, we pay a spe specific attention to uh, short-range free body non-additive term. Um, it could be uh, important. And we want to understand how important. And then, of course, we uh, ve very carefully created long-range interactions, actually um, doing this way that um, first we calculate ab initio, pairwise potential, and then uh, we uh, subtracted it from the full ab uh, initio potential and added instead uh, long-range uh, trimer uh, pairwise potentials, which we created from um, very well-known uh, dimer potentials, uh, um, which uh, um, check, you know, uh, formed from spectroscopic data. So here's the total reaction rates on the upper a graph, and uh, so here we compare uh, reaction rates for S-ray collisions at so a, a very low uh, collision energy range, uh, and uh, black curve shows uh, uh, full uh, calculation with full potential, and the red curve with uh, pairwise potential. And we see that rates pretty close. So it's again tell us that free body part of the, uh, this system, uh, collisional complex, uh, is small and um, possibly not very important. Uh, and here's the state to state distributions. And we see that the V equals zero uh, operational uh, distributions are uh, largest, and then after that, V equals one and two. 
So here I just compare uh, exact calculation with uh, universal rate for S wave, for example, collisions. And so they totally agree for the, but for uh, low temperatures. On this uh, slide, I, I show rate coefficients in the function, function of rotation quantum numbers for product uh, molecule, potassium 2, uh, again, with and without three body part. So blue uh, bars show uh, full potential calculation and red without three body part. So in spite of the fact that free body part not really large, uh, important for total reaction rate, but uh, the distribution of in product molecule uh, totally unrelated when we put free body part in or out. So the conclusion here that actually it has to be included, it has to be calculated, not by pairwise potentials, if you want to know more accurately the distributions in the product molecule. Here's a just a confirmation of this. We, we plot probability distribution as a function of um, scaled uh, reaction rate. Uh, and then you actually use different temperatures, and they all lie on exponential line showing independence, random distribution. Here, now I go to the case when we look beyond born oppenheim approximations. And actually, uh, in quantum chemistry, uh, this approximation uh, is like, Non born approximation is actually uh, very important in, in many cases. Uh, uh, coupling between rotational motion and nuclear motion become uh, quite strong, and therefore you have to include it. In the case of two uh, free atoms or more atoms, so larger molecules. Um, uh, in this case, uh, different potentials could uh, interact due to um, non-adiabatic coupling between them and even have conical interception. So uh, conditions under which just conical intersections are uh, investigated very well uh, in um, much higher temperature uh, chemistry, where they normally use uh, wave packet approach or hopping mechanism. But I already told you that uh, here we cannot use these approaches, unfortunately, which are developed very easily, uh, easy, and they can actually find codes, and it's much more easy. But this is. Uh, only way we can do right now is again using time independent uh, calculations. So here we started to do uh, uh, this um, investigation uh, using a lighter uh, systems. And then next step will be potassium rubidium plus potassium with two surfaces. We already prepared this uh, in, in investigation. So, um, but uh, fortunately, we, right now we started from single sigma lithium sodium molecules. The next step could be triplet sigma in order to uh, compare our results with predictions by Catterley group. Uh, here we look, of course, it's a little bit more simple case. Um, so, Here's a potential services, uh, doublet A, doublet B, and they cross in this line. And uh, they are shown exactly in, the, in the specific symmetry, C to V symmetry, uh, where um, 
they could cross. Uh, and this crossing, it's a line, uh, and it's called uh, at the seam of CI, and uh, it's shown here on the graph as a function of R, which is uh, when R1 and R2 equal, uh, uh, it is a synergy, and we compared location of this, uh, this seam with uh, entrance channel energy. So it's actually going through. So you cannot say uh, conical intersection somewhere, so we may include it or not, we use geometric phase, not. Here we have to include it directly in our equations, uh, coupling between these two surfaces. Uh, so, very important moment in order to uh, do dynamics. Uh, we have to diabetize surfaces. Uh, of course, we know all that uh, uh, calculations, uh, electronic structure calculations give us adiabatic surfaces. But uh, in case if uh, the surfaces interact, we have to uh, diabetize them. And, and then use it in dynamics. Uh, it, it, it's a convenient and it, it's important for different reasons. So, but first we calculate non-adiabatic coupling between surfaces. Uh, and then uh, this coupling, uh, this is adiabatic uh, energies. Uh, and then it depends on the mixing angle, which is we calculate uh, using uh, calculating gradients uh, of the potential surface for different geometries. So uh, I show one example only, but of course we have for all geometries uh, when theta angle uh, equals 60 degrees, when actually you can see conical intersection. And so how you can def identify it when uh, mixing angle drops perpendicular, uh, this is conical intersection. Uh, so why we have so many uh, so, uh, lines or uh, curves, it's just for different R1. This is function of R2, but, but you change also R1, it will be many curves because uh, if we change all geometries and uh, distance rho uh, all together. So here's the result. Uh, here's a total reaction rate first uh, on this graph. So uh, red curve, again, it's for S-way uh, collisions for low temperatures. Uh, here, S-way collision shows total rate, which agree well, as I already said, for potassium rubidium, but for lithium, uh, sodium plus lithium also uh, universal kind of. Uh, but when you include conic intersection, uh, then it becomes uh, orange line. Uh, so rate is just increased 1.2 times. Okay. Not maybe huge change, but there is. So then here we looked at the state-to-state uh, -state distribution force, first vibrational distribution, and each vibrational curve include, of course, distribution within, uh, mm -hmm, uh, within uh, a vibrational level all rotational states. It's, it's summation over. And uh, here for this reaction, of course, we have four now vibrational states could be occupied uh, in some rotational states too. So, but here we see a very unexpected uh, effect. So uh, if we uh, look at three different graphs, and the first graph shows uh, distributions uh, for even and odd uh, rotational states uh, within uh, vibrational states, uh, and they are um, using just uh, pairwise potential. And we, we can see there's no big difference. They are the same order, not only magnitude, but also kind of um, almost equal, a little bit different. 
Uh, but then we look at uh, uh, this free, uh, calculation when we include free body part. Uh, and then even one surface or two surfaces, uh, then uh, uh, odd symmetry is very much suppressed. So it's almost two order of magnitude suppression. So distribution is still different when we have a conical intersection or no conical intersection, but suppression in both cases uh, visible. Uh, here, uh, rotational distributions, and again, very funny, this is uh, uh, suppressed uh, for odd J's uh, and the distribution they're not different, smaller, bigger, but there are big, uh, actually very wide resonances uh, there. Um, and so conclusion here uh, that um, suppression most likely, not because geometric phase effect, but due to free body uh, non-additive contribution. So it changes potential certain way that it's uh, 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 start to suppress. And we, we now uh, investigate it more by just uh, putting factor in front of free body part and recalculating each time we look how it will change uh, to understand better. And now uh, we look at the statistics uh, uh, analyzing adiabatic potentials. Here is uh, with free body, without free body, potentials are different. Uh, it's kind of uh, more uh, two kind of two well potentials here. Uh, his upper low potential uh, and uh, this corn states as well. So when we analyze this potential density, like uh, ne nearest density, ne near neighbor, neighbor uh, level spacing distribution. Uh, is a function of um, a scale spacing, then uh, uh, for short uh, row, uh, points lie uh, on uh, almost Wigner Dyson distribution, not exactly, but very close. Uh, it means they avoid each other. There's a, a interaction between different channels at short distance. Uh, and then we we'll go further away than they'll rather lie on the Parson line. Uh, when in, no, they don't interact, they don't care, they could cross even. So, uh, and the presence of chaos in this reaction uh, may have very important implication uh, for ultra cold chemistry because. Uh, reaction become extremely sensitive to little changes, and so it will affect uh, the product distribution. Um, if I have one minute, I can tell that we studied uh, reactions between uh, atom molecules for two different cases. So uh, we determined multidimensional trimer potentials, uh, and we found that in both cases there are conical intersection between them. And so we performed close coupling calculations in hyperspherical coordinate. And total reaction rates uh, show uh, that um, CI actually increased reaction rate. And then, of course, uh, there's suppression for D wave. Uh, I'm not D wave. It's D um, for the odd uh, rotational states in product molecule, uh, which we still uh, try to understand in more details. It's certainly due to free body contribution. So, and then we also analyze. Uh, density of uh, the reaction channels and, and found uh, in both cases, actually, I didn't show for other case, uh, that at uh, a small uh, hyperradius, uh, it is always uh, chaotic. And then if you go further to uh, product or entrance channel, 
uh, then we, we we have Boston distribution. And this is uh, our uh, group members. And uh, thank you so much. Oh. just by a scaling factor, but because we were doing it that way, we could vary the potential very smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, and look at how the elastic and inelastic cross-sections changed as we varied that scaling factor. Mm -hmm. And what we found in lithium, for example, mm -hmm. uh, is that things changed by an order of magnitude well, several times across a 1% change in the potential. Uh, and, and what you get for any particular potential is, is almost random. Mm -hmm. Although, as we go to, went to greater kinetic energy releases, things became smoother and closer to university. So something I'm wondering with what you talked about, you talk about the importance of including the three body effects. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if you could actually look at these properties as a function of the fraction of three body effects. That you That's what we're doing now. Are, mm -hmm. you know, are many, Many times one percent. No, no, that's what we're doing now. Okay, because I suspect yeah, that's that they're important. going to go up and down many times between the, the the potential without three body and the potential with three body, and that actually what you've got are just two points on of an almost random. No. Well, I may not agree right now. Uh, I think there is a structures within the uh, short range potential, trimer potential, which could affect uh, this rate. But you're totally right that all these ab initio calculations not very exact, even you use a couple cluster calculation. Uh, and uh, um, you can change, uh, move around, um, so you don't know what to do, right? Yeah. We say how we done it, and it's the best approach we can do right now. And uh, of course, we wait results from experiment, and already there are signs that it it will come, maybe soon. Uh, now it's about uh, two molecules colliding, but maybe. Uh, sometimes would be molecule atom collisions. As you change the potential, you're squeezing states out of the well. And so yeah. No, I know. We, dry, we try, not in this case, in some other case, we've done it. I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's another question. Um, thank you for your talk. I find it very interesting that you have this uh, parity suppression of, um, yeah. in, in, in a sodium lithium case. Mm -hmm. um, is there any intuition to why it doesn't happen in the potassium rubidium case? Does geometric phase in this case play any role? Um. So that was idea maybe because atom molecule, because of lithium, atom molecule, uh, the reduced mass almost the same when it's lithium present, and it there is some kind of uh, uh, so precedence in chemistry uh, when there is suppression of so certain symmetry uh, when this happened. So, but uh, we have to understand that. So it's certainly two order of magnitude, very significant. Uh, so maybe it's effect or uh, so. And potassium rubidium, yeah, accidentally shown a graph here. It's potassium rubidium, actually. Uh, this is even a knot, uh, full potential. It's not pairwise. So not they are different, right? Not similar what sodium lithium shows. So. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That was previous. Uh, so, so you expect similar thing to happen 
Yeah. Yeah. It is paralyzed, right? It goes away. So it's kind of something within the complex. Uh, some reach maybe or normally we don't have barrier, right? But there could be some kind of structures which could create this. But again, like Jeremy said, you have to be sure that it's real things, right? Yeah. All right, so one last question. If not, then let's thank all speakers and say bye. We should get out of the fast as a room and uh, lunch in the library. We continue to talk. Yeah, yeah, take everything out of the room. Uh, there's another group in here uh, until 4 2.